So the paper is Living Myth Silent Paper. Um, or did you know that an applied program is still on the books? <laughs> Bruce and I co-wrote this paper, so there are going to be some times where I'm reading in the third person that sound absurd. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Dan is a PhD candidate in applied anthropology. <laughs> this is his fifth year at Columbia, and he is revising a dissertation on private equity investors. As part of his and Bruce's investigations into the origins of that, the one that Dan is in, applied program, Bruce did a lot of archival work, and Dan conducted a few interviews with TC and GSAS faculty, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Skirmerhorn, across the street, just for people who are not from around here. In one interview with an older member of the GSAS faculty, some ways into the conversation, the professor leaned back and said, you know, I think there's still an applied PhD program on the books. <laughs> the insinuation being that the program's continued hypothetical existence is one of those curious atavisms or even spandrels that universities sprout from time to time. Sure, one could make a PhD in applied anthropology, but really, do we have anyone around who would want to do that? <laughs> Dan pointed out that he had in fact been in this program for some time now and intended to graduate from it. <laughs> and the interview moved along, talking about the 60s, Marvin Harris, the Skirmerhorn Empire. And while this professor was at least aware of the possibility of an applied anthropology program, he claimed to know little about its origins or its history despite being at the university for just about all of it. <laughs> so the interaction is a nice introduction to the patchy coverage of origin stories. Dan embodied the applied program. He's in it and he knows about it. What's more, he knows the origin stories about the program. The professor is a good stand-in for the university's institutional memory of the program, a record that goes so far as to acknowledge basic existence <laughs> and not much else. So this paper will comment on two instances of this disjuncture between a program's or a department's own founding myths, and what physical traces in the form of archival material have to say about that history. This paper will wonder why we say we're descended from gods and rely on disciplinary and programmatic myths that set up a charismatic, ideal, big bang that often sets up an origin moment compared to which we find ourselves wanting. So Boaz and anthropology. The founding myth of anthropology at Columbia is a neat one. Boaz explained in a 1908 essay in Columbia University Quarterly that anthropology at Columbia preceded Boaz's own arrival in 1896 since there was a joint general course given by Professors Ferrand of Psychology and Ripley of Political Sciences. However, um, in 1896, he began consolidating the department. The Columbia Anthropology Department's website uh, goes on to modestly locate anthropology's beginnings with Herodotus's curiosity about strange <laughs> cultures. It then leaps to Boaz <laughs> and his commitment to the idea of the uniqueness of each culture and to the observation and recording of those cultures in the field in all aspects and as much po detail as possible. His students, Boaz's, disciples, apostles, found, fanned out and founded departments of their own around the country. And of course, American anthropology as we know it was born. Thank you, Columbia. <laughs> so this, however, would be a dull paper if this were the alpha and the omega for Columbia anthropology. Contained in the same archive as Boaz's article, there's a paper by a student named Matthew Kelly written for Joan Vincent's Theories of Culture class in an unknown year detailing the history of Columbia anthropology. <laughs> One of the first mentions of the emerging discipline is from Columbia President Barnard. In his 1878 to 79 letter to the Columbia trustees, he made the case for Columbia becoming a European style research university and creating appropriate graduate faculties. As part of his vision, he argued that graduate faculty should include poetry, the fine arts, comparative philology, commerce, statistical science, social science, diplomacy, international law, ethnology, oriental literature, and the like. <laughs> Three years later, still pressing his case to the trustees, he writes more in detail about the inclusion of ethnology and anthropology and speculates on what the scattered bones, weapons, ornaments, and other works of humanity, as well as the peculiarities of organic structure and products of skill of savage races still existing, might reveal about a common origin of humanity. 
To further argue it's fit for Columbia, he goes on to list several prominent American anthropologists working in the field, including the president of the American Anthropological Society, E.G. Squire, and Lewis Henry Morgan, as well as several others working with Native American communities. Then, in the 1893 course catalog, Boaz came in 1896, we see the appearance of the first classes related to anthropological concerns in the School of Political Science, which housed the Department of Sociology and Statistics. Professor Franklin Giddings offered many of these early forays, and uh, if his 1986 introductory textbooks bibliography is any indication, students were already reading almost every major sociological or anthropological work then published, including Morgan, Spencer, Wallace, Durkheim in French, Tyler, Tyler and of course, Boas. In the spring of 1894, William Ripley gave the first course in anthropology by name, Physical Geography and Anthropology. At this same time, Livingston Farron, a graduate of Columbia's medical school, returned from further studies abroad to work in <coughs> Cattell's new experimental psychology lab and offered, in addition to psychology courses, a course titled Anthropology. True to the physical anthropological bias in much of the anthropology at this time, both Ripley and Farron engaged in quite a bit of head measuring, particularly of freshmen. <laughs> Ripley published his findings on anthropogeography primarily concerned with Europe, which Boaz criticized in print just, for beginning, just before beginning his lectureship. So clearly anthropology existed in a fair amount of depth and variety at Columbia prior to Boaz, but the university granted no degrees. Alfred Krober is known as the first student to receive a doctorate in anthropology at the university in 1901 with his 28-page dissertation. Those were the days. <laughs> it is actually in 1895-96, again, the year before Boaz arrives, that we see the first students listed in the register as studying anthropology. The next academic year, there are five students listing anthropology as part of their degree, and three of them cross-listing anthropology and education and psychology. In 1898-99, we see the first TC students listed. It was the first year it was part of the university. Most notably, Frank Clarence Spencer received his doctorate in education with a minor in anthropology in 1900, the year before Grover. His dissertation was on the education of the Pueblo child, the study of arrested development. Apparently, he did something like field work, a somewhat extended personal contact with these Indians. That's a quote. <laughs> so it seems, even at the early stages of his life at Columbia, anthropology was eclectic and at teacher's college. There was another TC student studying anthropology at the university in 1899, Harriet Luddington, as well as three teacher's college scholars listing their subject as education and anthropology. And of course, there was Elsie Clues Parsons, a Barnard graduate student who received her doctorate in education in 1899 with a minor in sociology, whose Pueblo anthropology would become well known in the 20th century. Even beyond Elsie Clues Parsons, we have three other Barnard College graduate students registered in 1899 as studying anthropology, listed as special students or candidates at the university. So not only was anthropology in a fairly sophisticated way extant at Columbia prior to Boaz and Krober, it was at Teachers College in Barnard as well. President Seth Lowe oversaw Columbia's move to Morningside Heights, including the funding of the Lowe Library, named after his father and paid for with his inheritance. In a letter welcoming Boaz to CU, Lowe notes that anthropology was located between three departments, philosophy, which housed psychology, political science, and pure science, where Boaz had just been made a lecturer. This division was presented as a strength, and Lowe mentions that he formed a committee on anthropology made up of four professors, Cattell, Giddings, Wooding, Woodward, and Peck, that would oversee the work until we were prepared to create such a department. As Boaz and Farron handled the introductory courses, Ripley added a course in 1897 to 98 and 98 to 99 called Applied Anthropology the first formal mention of our subject today in the university archive. Of course, Ripley left the anthropology fold and see you completely by 1902. He was offered better pay at Harvard. <laughs> so in spring of 1902, the Columbia trustees resolved that anthropology would be constituted as an independent department alongside psychology. The above archival perspective reminds us of several things. Anthropology began as an interdisciplinary study, and its presence at Columbia was in part due to the vision and efforts of administrators and not faculty, or not just faculty. Its early students included education doctoral students. Anthropology preceded not only Boaz, but the Department of Education split to Teachers College. And perhaps most noteworthy for our purposes, a course on applied anthropology, again, was offered 1897 to 99. 
Anthropology at Columbia had no Big Bang. Boaz was able, however, to preside over the unification of several diffuse programs of study and guide the ongoing formation of a discipline from the vantage point of an academic department. Okay, now on to TC. So again, anthropology is a long history at Teachers College, many years prior to the formation of the Applied Anthropology PhD program in the late 60s. I thought we had 25 minutes on the... Oh. Uh, 45 to 11 times? Mm. Go ahead. We'll see. <laughs> so anthropology is a long history at Teachers College, many years prior to the formation of applied anthropology in the, in the late 1960s. As early as February 1904, we have noticed in the spectator of Dr. Farron giving a lecture on TC, at TC on the relation of anthropology to education and whether EPOT culture theory was applicable to the problem of education. In April of 1933, Malinowski gave a series of three lectures at Teachers College, beginning with how can anthropology be applied to modern life in the TC chapel. That lecture apparently focused on disarmament and war as an anachronism based on an analysis of the cultural facts of history. <laughs> Margaret Mead, as Michael Scroggins pointed out uh, in his paper in this conference last year, taught several courses at Teachers College throughout the 40s. She reportedly recruited Saul Kimball, the 1952 to 53 president of the Society for Applied Anthropology, to Teachers College in 1953. This was also reportedly due to Mead's deploring ivory towers and her conviction that anthropology had a lot to say to other professions, a task that presumably wasn't being fulfilled by the Skirmahorn faculty at the time. Kimball launched his new interest in schooling and was, of course, a major long-term collaborator with Conrad Ehrensberg. Uh, Kimball took on an ambitious teaching load at TC during his decade and a half there. He also proposed a social and applied anthropology postdoc for people involved in teacher training to teach them anthropological principles. Again, collaborations and cross-pollination between TC and CU continued, and some seem to have always felt a pressing need to emphasize anthropology's application. Always present, whether acknowledged or not, to not just study conditions, as one professor noted in an interview, but to change conditions. So what about the myth of the program's founding, of the joint program applied anthropology, about it as a timely and called for response to the strikes, riots, and disturbances of 1968 at the university? Students in our program rarely receive any clear explanation of why the program was started and under what circumstances. Those who have sought out some articles of establishment or a memorandum of understanding with the GSAS faculty have found no such words in any of the university's archives. And so the myth that they recycle goes something like this. In 1968, students occupied Columbia and demanded changes to their education in keeping with the times, removal of ROTC, better relationships between the predominantly white university and the mostly black neighborhoods around Columbia, the creation of representative bodies like the university senate, and somewhere in the shuffle, the students demanded more relevant academic work. The anthropologists around Columbia took up the challenge and created a joint PhD in applied anthropology, which shared <coughs> funding, faculty, and students with the GSAS department. These Edenic days lasted until the GSAS department went into receivership. Or post-structuralism happened. <laughs> or a skepticism towards the morality of applied work crept across the discipline. Pick your poison. We were cast out of Eden, left to fend for ourselves and bear the shame of our exiled faculty. Lamentations, gnashing of teeth. You get the idea. This in its own way is a neat story. Students demanded relevant pedagogy. An applied program was the answer. The university and the state approved the program in record time because of recent uprisings. And then anthropology lost its way. This narrative suits a number of people well. If professors have fallen out of the mainstream of the discipline, they can decry the perfidy of and betrayal of changing intellectual winds. Students can pick up the mantle of 1960s activism and continue doing the good work of liberating their society. But like most good stories, this one isn't quite right. We could find no record in the Skirmahorn faculty of deliberation over and creation of an applied program, and only one mention at the June 1968 faculty meeting of the Teacher's College Plan amidst the general reorganization of the department. In an interview with one of the founders of the PhD Applied Anthropology program noted another different story. The professor observed that Charles Harrington and Bill Dalton arrived at Teachers College in 1967 with degrees from Harvard in Social Relations and Manchester in Social Anthropology, respectively. They were hired to support the programs and courses in anthropology and education. They also felt like outsiders at Columbia. They noted that the only person in the anthropology department at the time who didn't have a Columbia PhD was Conrad Ahrensberg, Harvard, the man who had been teaching courses in applied anthropology in the GSAS department, Ahrensberg. 
The rest of the apartment was still haunted by the ghost of Julian Stewart and various ecological paradigms. What's more, Harrington and Dalton had no interest in, quote, being put in the mode of the dowdy teacher's college professor. <laughs> they felt that their degrees were first rate, and they also felt it was absurd that people were running around claiming to be anthropologists with just a master's in applied anthropology. They felt like master's work didn't give people sufficient time to get good at field work. So the two young professors, with perhaps more chutzpah than sense, put together a proposal for a PhD program in applied anthropology. They noted that the faculty executive committee at Teachers College didn't know what to make of these anthropologists. Dalton and Harrington argued that TC has a history of applied work, and there were a lot of people coming back from the Peace Corps for whom the program would be attractive. These folks knew what they wanted anthropology to do for them. So in more a vein of confusion than overt support, the faculty executive committee approved the applied PhD program, and it was on various presidents' desks in the spring of 68. Here is where the myth of 68 comes in. The professor guesses that the program was approved as quickly as it was because of all the politics and turmoil that was in the air. This was a good time for it. Students were out picketing, and just like that, they admitted the first, three doc uh, first six doctoral students, three by GSAS and three by Teachers College. And between Marvin Harris and Conrad Ahrensberg at GSAS and Dalton, Harrington, and Comitas, who had returned from leave the year the program was proposed, there was truly a joint program at least for a little while. In the early days, there was a fair amount of grant money around to pay for PhD fellowships from places like the National Institute for Mental Health and foundations with an interest in nursing. What's more, TC faculty serve in the executive committee with Barnard faculty of the GSAS, the Mothership Anthropology Department. Then, of course, paradise was lost. The department went into receivership and was chaired by a classicist. The Barnard and TC faculty were turned out of the garden because they were going to spoil the tenure case of one of the classicist's friends, and that was that. The professor went on to note that they were always able to admit a more eclectic mix of students than the GSAS faculty. They took people with anthropology backgrounds, older people, people from the Peace Corps, and so on. He also noted that they never defined what applied anthropology exactly ought to be. And this fits our prejudice as well. It seems obvious that anthropology is always doing something, and thereby applied to something or other, whether you're applying it to your tenure case, writing policy-relevant recommendations, deliberately trying to change people's material or cultural traditions, or even taking up the old role of public intellectual, arguing about coming of age or whether Muslim women need saving. Your anthropology is doing something and is applied to some end. So this program was open to these myriad impulses within anthropology. We can't verify this version of our program's founding in any sort of archival evidence. We don't have correspondence. We don't even have a proposal. The New York Office of Higher Education has only the fact that it is a program on record. This, however, sounds a good deal more persuasive than the faculty responding in a substantive way to the intellectual demands of their students. Two professors found a space, a precedence, and a bit of a chip on their shoulder. And they started a program that allowed more space for maneuver in terms of academic projects and potential students than a typical anthropology program. And part of the reason they were able to do this is because of a lengthy history of applying anthropology at Columbia. So in the larger case of the discipline of anthropology in Boaz's Big Bang, and in the smaller case of the founding of an applied anthropology PhD program at Columbia, we've seen a mythical charter that contradicts archival and interview accounts of departmental and programmatic origin. What's more, in the larger discipline of anthropology, it often feels like we're trying to recapture the Boazian sacred bundle of the four fields. Or more narrowly, in applied anthropology, to rediscover the hot urgency of 1968 and Margaret Mead's expansive notion of anthropology. In many ways, these origin stories do crucial work in the context of the myth of the eternal return. Severin Fowles, in his book, An Archaeology of Doings, talks about modernity's dominant myth of eternal return. He notes a widespread habit of thought that, as opposed to a two-point progression from primitivism to modernity, people see a vision of an original, natural condition to which we strive to return. Three points instead of two, idyllic origin, biblical fall, revitalization, and renewal. For Fowles, this emerges in archaeologists seeking and constructing pristine, egalitarian, and communal, small-scale prehistoric societies who have primordial religion, which sits upon a kind of moral pedestal as having a practical, tolerant, democratic, <laughs> ecologically adaptive, and supportive of both the individual and the community. Sounds like anthropology. With which archaeologists use as a fabricated foil for modernities or state society's faults. Similarly, we can see these anthropological founding myths as pointing toward a pure inspirational founding moment. They both rely on charismatic, iconoclastic origins and resemble our discipline's romantic fascination with solitary, far-removed fieldwork. 
The problem with this mode of thinking and saint making is that it pushes us to look backwards towards a past that never was and masks a more complicated institutional precursor to any sort of big bang moment. So we suggest that more interesting questions for applied anthropology are not so much how can we recapture things when they were allegedly better, but ask ourselves what institutional and disciplinary strengths are at hand and on which we can draw to make our scholarship relevant now.